Yes, people, what's happening? Welcome back to Chelsea Fan TV and welcome to another episode of the Chelsea Fan TV podcast. Before we get into today's episode, make sure you smash the likes on the video, subscribe to Chelsea Fan TV if you haven't done so already, and leave your thoughts in the comments below whether you agree or disagree with any of the topics we have covered today. And what a January window it was. Seven new faces coming through the door and topping it off on deadline with a British record signing of Enzo Fernandez for... £106 million. Pounds. It's the Chelsea way. It's a new way of doing things. It certainly lifted the mood around the place. It's made everyone feel good. Uh, it's kind of forgotten about being 10th on the table, forgotten about how difficult it's been this season. And there's, there I said, there's a sense of positivity heading into tomorrow's game against Fulham. But Lewis, transfer window. Uh, I don't think any of us at the start of the month expected us to get A, as many players in as we did, and B, the quality of the players that we got in as well. I mean, it surpassed all expectations. Yeah. I, I mean, fair play to Todd Bowley, to the entire board, because they've done an amazing job. But even more so, they've said that they were going to do this and they've backed it up. I remember one of the directors, I, I can't remember the name for the life of me, but I remember he did an interview after one of our Champions League games. He said, expect a very big window in January. I thought, like, just two players, get me a midfielder, get me a right back, I'm happy. I don't expect you to do anything with the attack because I wouldn't expect us to prioritise it. We got a midfielder, a right back, yeah, he's coming in the summer, but you know what, next season's the priority, not this season, so that's fine. We've got a world-class midfielder and a world-class right back, by the way, I need to give them that. Four forwards, four forwards. Some with promise, some that are going to go have already gone straight into the team and already shown how brilliant they are in Felix and Mudrick. Badia Shield, who's got his two clean sheets on the bounce since he's come into the squad. And these are all been their signings. They've all hit the ground running. I know there's still plenty of games to go and everything, but compared to what we have right now, it already looks more promising. And they've done what should have been a summer window's worth of progress in a winter window. And they've said they're going to do the same thing again next summer. Fair play. Fair play to them because, yeah, this season this season to me is still kind of a write-off, but I feel a lot more optimistic now. I feel a lot more optimistic about our long-term future. I definitely think Chelsea will be coming back. And wherever we finish is wherever we finish. I know our long-term future is secured. So, yeah, I couldn't be happier. Couldn't be Yeah, happier. mate, it's certainly a change from kind of the first half of the season and all that negativity and doom and gloom around the place. Mm -hmm. It's definitely made a difference. And I think... One thing that I like is that these guys are coming. Yes, they're a successful businessman. You know, he's done well at the LA Dodgers baseball, but football's totally different. And the fact, you know, they've made the effort, they've put the hours in to go and, you know, meet clubs, put all the legwork in over the summer, form good relationships. And they're just prepared to turn up, fresh out a deal and not take no for an answer. It's that level of ambition that we've lacked in the transfer market for years and years and years. And it makes such a big difference, you know, to see that we're not just a joke of a club in the transfer market. We, you know, when Chelsea turn up to do business, they're serious and mm. we, we're not leaving without getting a deal done. I mean, the Enzo Fernandez is a, class, a, a case and example, you know, we're delighted we got him in. It took a, it went a bit longer than we would, would have liked. But the fact that, you know, we're negotiating with Benfica for what best pass, what the last two days before the deadline, you hear like 20 hour negotiations, literally egg barley and stuff. We're not leaving until he's on the plane with us. Um, driving a hard bargain. It's the sort of stuff that you want. And it's kind of people that are serious at the top, which you've not had for a while. But in terms of Enzo, mate, obviously, you know, there were talks of Caicedo earlier uh, earlier in the month. I guess that was kind of the, the, the plan B option. Um, how pleased are you that we actually got this deal done? Because the more it was going on, I was kind of thinking, oh, I don't know if we're going to get him. We're certainly not going to get him for right now. I thought we might be able to do a Gusto type deal where we agree a deal when he comes in the summer. But to get him now, I mean, how pleased are you with that? Because it does, admittedly, you know, Jorginho's gone and stuff and it's kind of one in, one out in the midfield. But in terms of the rebuild and the fact that in the summer, he would have had a lot more people in for him as well. He might not have chosen Chelsea in the summer, uh, given not knowing what, what football we're going to be playing European-wise. Mm -hmm. This is a massive, massive result for one of the best midfielders in world football at the moment, despite the fact that he's not played many games at the top level. It's such a flex as well, by the way, because <laughs> we spent the whole of January just being told outright no. And from the way we were moving, I thought we just don't really have the funds for that. And I understood that for 160 million, that is a lot, especially to pay up front. They end up getting it sorted on an installment plan and paying way over the amount, but at a much cheaper alternative. 
like four, I think it's 14 million a year that we're paying. And the first payment doesn't even go to them, it goes to River Plate. Yeah, they're, so, they're 20, who, yeah, River Plate owe 25 mil from that. And I think it's 40 million pounds up front is the initial payment. And then the installments are whatever they are for the rest of the life. And it's like five installments over the next few years. It's ridiculous. And, and they've done it at something that is a positive. It looks smart. And also, I'm now going into the next window with full confidence. I've been saying on all my streams, if I hear they're going after Mbappe, I believe you. If I hear you're going after Haaland, you're going after De Bruyne, you name it. Saka from Arsenal, bring in Messi if you want. I believe they can go and do it. Because this, to me, was such a massive statement. Such a big statement. So my confidence is through the roof with Bowley. And I already had belief in him from the start. I thought Roman ain't going to leave us with no bum who's just going to take money out of the club and care more about the brands than actually the football on the pitch. I thought we were going to be in safe ads. That statement just secures it. So, yeah, couldn't be happier with it. And as the player as well, didn't even say about that, exactly the profile we need. We've been saying for weeks we need a ball winner that has a final pass in them that can dictate play as well. He is like Jorginho and N'Golo Kante rolled into one with a better range of passing. Yeah, and the we fact that he's 20... The fact that he's 22 as well, he can he's only going to get better. So, like, think how good he is now. And we're not just buying how good he is now. We're buying the potential as well. This is, you're looking at, I mean, potentially one of the best midfield players in the world in, in the next, well, mm -hmm. in the next couple, in the next two and to three is, years. He's locked in for eight years. Yeah. And that, and that again, it's, it goes back to the smart business. It's, it's that trade-off, you know. Yes, OK, you offer the long contracts uh, to, to make it look better on the books. And Chelsea are kind of hedging their bets on the fact that, these guys are going to work out in the long term for us, and that's that 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 side of the risk is better than, you know, making the books not look as good by offering shorter contracts and having to pay a bit more. And I think it's a gamble, definitely worth taking. And with the caliber of players we're signing, look, I think we're fully aware that not every single signing is going to work out. There's going to be some that don't go to plan. But I guess when you offer the long term contracts as well, these players are of an age where they they've got resale value, so we're not going to lose a significant amount of money on players that potentially don't work out. But in terms of Enzo, mate, obviously we'll get onto the Fulham game later. But where do you expect him to sort of fit in for the second half of the season? Obviously, Jorginho's gone, which we'll touch on. But it looks like he's depending on what Potter goes with. If he goes with a, with a pivot, he'll obviously be one of those one of those players, perhaps the more advanced one, maybe, but can do both roles. Um, but if we go with a three man midfield, you probably expect him to play as the six, given now that there's not really any natural sixes in the squad at all. But I think the massive appeal for him is the fact that he's not just one dimensional. He's got everything, you know, he can play as a box to box. He can play as an eight. He's got a goal in him. He's got that range of passing, but he's also got those defensive capabilities to where while it's not his ideal position, he can also play as a six. So I think we've got someone that's a great midfield player, but is equally good at a number of different midfield positions. Yeah, I think his best position is an eight from yeah. what I've seen. So I, I don't like this thing that we always seem to do where it's like we shoehorn players into our yeah. position. And fair play, Enzo Fernandez might be that guy that can play all those positions. I've heard that a lot. And then it turns out that they're only really elite at one position. And then you've been playing them out of position for a while and you've been stunting their development. I'll let us do that with Enzo and we'll see how he performs. But... For the start, I just want him to play where he's at his best and play him at the eight. If you want to put Zakaria deeper when he comes back, I guess for the game against Fulham, he's going to have to play as a six because we've got literally nobody else that can play that role. But if we can put someone else there, I'd rather we did that and just play him as the eight. But like you said, we'll probably experiment with him in a range of different positions. This is an experimental phase of the project. Like, there's no targets for this season. It's just about seeing how the team plays and seeing how we get the best out of players or whoever isn't good enough. So do what you want with him. But for me, just play him in his, like, best position. So just play him as an eight. Yeah, I mean, how important is it is it going to be as well that obviously coming in for a British record, there's going to be a lot of pressure on him. British media, we know, are notorious at micro-analyzing everything. They're going to be on him, bro. Yeah, they, 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 this, is, this is my point. Like, everything he does is going to be analysed. Like, if he has one bad touch, oh, I, I can't believe they've paid this much. It's already started. Danny Murphy. Remember Mudrick? You... Yeah. They were Mutrick. on his first touch because he had yeah. that meaty one in the Liverpool game. Yeah. Mate, they're, they're, they're on it and it's going to be no different with Enzo. You know, you've already got it with Danny Murphy to, like in the papers today. You know, oh, 
he's not worth this, he's not worth that. Oh, it's a massive gamble. Look, to, to a certain degree, it is a gamble, but every transfer is a gamble, you know. So I, I, I don't buy it, but everything's going to be microanalyzed for him. I mean, how difficult is it do you think it's going to be for him? Because he's a young guy, he's 22, he's coming in, not got much experience in top flight football. Yes, he's a World Cup winner, but he's played a handful of games with Benfica. He's played a few Champions League games in his career. Um, this is, it's going to be tough for him as well. We've got to be patient, haven't we? It's not just going to come in and suddenly everything's going to be unbelievable. Yeah, and also the thing is, our midfield is still not cohesive at all. No. Our only true six, we sold to Arsenal. Yeah. And even that six had issues in his game. So, I don't know. Like If Enzo can shine individually, or if he can carry the midfield on his back, there is the price tag right there. But it's going to be sink or swim in the eyes of every other rival fan. If he has a bad game against Fulham, they're on to him. The fail comps are going to be off the scale. They're going to all sorts of edits and like the maddest music imaginable, all sorts of crap. So, yeah, if he doesn't hit the ground running, like we'll give him patience, but they're all going to be on to him. That price tag won't go away. He'll have to play at that level. And I do believe like we'll judge him as he develops. And I I'm not going to judge him if he struggles initially. Like our midfield's crap. We wanted it yeah. prioritized first. Like we still need like another midfielder or two in the summer. Yeah. But being honest, but if he comes in, carries it on his back, he'll silence the haters. And yeah, we'll just have to see. I mean, I look at it like this as well. The fact that what we've essentially done this this January window is basically been a summer window. But the plus mm. that we've got is that all these players are going to have six months in. The, well, they're going to have the second half of the season to kind of learn the league, get some minutes under their belts, bed into the team a little bit. So this is almost like a pre-season and we're already now, this is where we lay the foundations for next season. So we lay these foundations in the second half of the season, we build on them in pre-season and then next season, I think, is really when you're going to see how good this Chelsea team is. But I think, I mean, we'll come back to the other signings in a, in a sec, but do you think now, mate, that the expectations, do you reckon they've shifted at all for the rest of the season? Now that there's been all this investment, do you think that Chelsea fans and yourself and that, are you thinking that actually we need a bit more in this second half of the season? Or are the expectations the same? Just, you know, pick up as many points as we can and just try and get as high up the table as we can. And whatever happens in the Champions League, it happens. Nope. But that's also me personally. Like, yeah. I know there's going to be fans that think differently. I'm going to judge it as the season goes. If we get into a position where we can get top four, fine, just go for top four. If the opportunity is there, take it. But I don't think we'll do it. I think we've got too much work to do. And I think the first half of the season was just so bad. You're looking at 10, 11 game winning runs if we're going to be serious about getting into top four and maintaining it. Because I don't think that top four changes. I've said no, that since the bottom that point. The only team in the top four, we could get Tottenham because yeah. Tottenham don't look sustainable at all. We can finish above Liverpool. Liverpool have the same issues that we have, but without the window that we've had. So we can get above them. I think we can get into the European spots, but I don't think we get top four. But then realistically, in my head, I'm thinking, do we want Europa League? Do we want Conference League? Like, maybe you could go for Europa because that is just a secondary avenue into the Champions League. Yeah. If God forbid we have, a, we have a terrible second season, that would be there. And if that's the case, go for it because I do believe we can get into the European spots. Like, I think we're good enough for that now. Top four, though, not so sure. Like, we got a winnable run of games, but the running, I've been saying about that running. Mate, the there running's so hard. There many issues. Man United away, Arsenal away. City. Um, our last two games are City away and Newcastle at home. Then you've got Bournemouth away, which I know you say is Bournemouth, but they'll be in a relegation fight. And we don't like Bournemouth anyway. We never beat them. Forest, like, we got Forest. We saw what they did to us. Yeah. It's not going to be easy. So I, I don't see it. I really don't see it. But I'm also willing to be proved wrong. Just get yeah. to that position and then I'll personally invest. Until then, I want my 11 points and then I've signed out. I mean, I think we're top five, top six, definitely capable of doing it. I think the problem we've got with top four is the fact we're not just chasing one team. We're looking at having to gain points on four, five, six teams. And the chances of that mm -hmm. happening, whilst they're possible... I just, I just don't see it as that likely. We'd have to go on a on a. We'd have to probably go on a a, a streak of going unbeaten in ten games. Really, you'd have to look at maybe eight wins, a couple of draws, or something. Nine wins and a draw, or something like that to 
really haul ourselves back into contention and say with the running as well, it, it's going to be tricky. But yeah, I think there's there's definitely, you know, cause to be positive. Um, it, the, the owners have held up their side of the bargain. They've heavily invested. They've bought in some of the best players. Now it's down to the to players to deliver for Graham Potter and his coaching staff to deliver because the owners have done their bit now. So it's on the players and the manager to now do their bit. So we'll have to kind of wait and see what happens on that. But in terms of outgoings, mate, just back to the window briefly. Um, we'll get to Jorginho in a sec. Hakim Ziyech, what a mess that was. You know, he's, go, get, he's going to PSG on loan. He's in Paris. He's done the medical. He's done the club media stuff in the morning. Um, PSG saying that Chelsea sent the, the wrong docu- sent the wrong documents three times. Uh, that's their version of events. Obviously, Chelsea putting out a different version of events as they would because they don't want to be seen as kind of clowns and whatnot in this situation. But, hmm. I mean, you've had all... From the moment Madueke was signed, it was obvious that Ziyech could go. So why were we waiting until the last throws of the window to to let to try and get a deal done for Ziyech? That's my first thing. Second thing, I, I don't understand how... The, whatever's happened with documentation, I've got no idea. But I think in in this whole mess, I actually feel a bit sorry for Hakim Ziyech personally because I actually look, he's not been great at Chelsea, but he's been a good professional. He's not kicked up a fuss. You know, mm. he's done pretty well for us in the last few games. He's, I've noticed a change in attitude since he's come back from the World Cup. And I just feel sorry for him that he thought he was going to be playing a PSG player, you know, going to be playing with Messi, Neymar, and Mbappe and whatnot. Um, and then within 24 hours, he's back at Cobham and he's training again today. Uh, what, what do you make of the whole situation? Yeah, the first thing I'd say is like, Z- I, I feel really bad for Ziyech because like the guy was literally there in the offices and the deal didn't go through. And yeah, it was kind of our fault with everything. From what I heard, we sent the document twice without signatures and then the third one came in too late. But I mean, it's, it's kind of our fault because, like, whoever's in charge has had an absolute howler. But let, let's not act like Ziyech hasn't been on sale for the last six months. Yeah. And then PSG, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think they've done anything in this January window. They've mm, barely done no. anything. From what I looked in the in their subreddit, they're not happy with the window. And they're complaining that they went in for Ziyech too late. And I'm thinking the same thing. Why did you wait till January the 30th to go for Hakim Ziyech? When that guy has been on the transfer sale, he's been in the market for about six months. Like, it's right there. So, it's kind of our fault, but PSG, they move too slow. Like, you get to January the 30th, every focus is on Enzo Fernandez. Sorry we sent our, like, worst intern or some work experience student to sort out the ZH deal, but why'd you leave it till that long? That's what I'm thinking. So... We're 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 in the wrong, obviously, but PSG they move too slow, so that's yeah. on them too. Yeah, I think you know it's just it's just an unfortunate set of circumstances. You know, you have got all the time in the window to to get this done, and it goes to the last few minutes. Chelsea obviously all hands on deck for the for the Enzo deal, and obviously something's gone wrong with this Ziyech one. I mean, it'd be interesting to see what his mindset is now. I'm sure you know Potter will speak to him, have a conversation and whatnot, and try and get him to knuckle down for the rest of the season. I'm sure, and I still think he can contribute in some way going forward. I mean, Madawake is obviously a young player. Sterling's going to be on that right-hand side as well. Um, he might see minutes hard to come by, but I still think he can play a useful role for the remainder of the season. But in terms of the main outgoing, Jorginho, it's sort of, it almost come out of nowhere. You know, mm-hmm. the day, like the day before deadline day, in the, in the evening, sort of come out that, oh, Arsenal are, 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 are really interested in Jorginho. And then by nine o'clock the next morning, it was done. Ten million pounds plus two million bonuses, uh, one million if they qualify for the Champions League, and obviously one million if Arsenal win the Premier League. Um, Jorginho kind of divided opinion when he was signed, divided opinion when he was here, and he divided opinion when he left. Um, what are your thoughts on him? Because I actually think he had a if you look at it on the whole, I actually think his Chelsea career has been very good and he's been a great servant to the club and he's given us some some great moments, he's given us some some really good performances, but a lot of people don't see it that way. What 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 are your thoughts on it? Um, I I don't think it was the right time to let him go, but I understand only because it was from a financial perspective. Because sell someone for with six months left, let them go for free or get or get twelve million. Like I get that on the pitch though. Well, on the pitch and off the pitch though, I think you you, you lose a leader in the dressing room and a vocal player on the pitch. And I also thought he'd be good depth for us. And that's what annoys yeah. me the most because Arsenal, personally, are looking for depth. 
They're in a title race. I want anything on this planet except an Arsenal win. And I feel like we've just helped them now. Chelsea fans who didn't like Jorginho are all laughing at it because, I mean, the one player they despise has gone to Arsenal. And whatever, fair play. Like, I've got players that I don't really like. And if they leave, I'll be partying too. So it is what it is. The game is the game. But personally, I think Jorginho as rotation is a great option for any team. I always keep speaking about how I see him potentially playing the Mikel role where he comes on in the last 10, 15 minutes, slows down the game and just controls possession like he's always good at. He's now in a better midfield at Arsenal, in a better role for him, as opposed to us, who just start him every single game because of all of our midfield injuries. I don't think we've made the right move in this one, honestly. The only reason why I understand it, and it's not a complete zero out of 10 move, is because it was financial. Yeah. And that we at least got some money instead of letting him go for free. But to me... I don't like it. I think we've low-key strengthened Arsenal just a little bit. And I think we've also helped them out in their title race. And that's just really, really frustrating. But whatever. Jorginho is going to go anyway. We needed yeah. to move on from him. So I just think that like we're still going to build a good team anyway. So from our perspective, we will be fine. But just don't like helping Arsenal. Yeah, no, I, I hear it. And, and and to be fair, like I thought, I, like as soon as the Enzo deal was announced, you kind of just forget that Jorginho had even gone. Uh, mm -hmm. it, 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 it yeah, was a bit I, of a I didn't weird... care past that point. Yeah. I thought like, it was a bit depressing before that, but still. Yeah, I mean, look, uh, for me, I, I agree. Look, I think we could have done with him for, for for squad rotation for the rest of the season, but it's got to the point where we do need to move on from the likes of Jorginho, move on from the likes of Kante, maybe Kovacic as well in the next six months or or to a year. So. Yeah, it was the right. It's you could argue is it the right time? Probably not, but I don't think you can say no to twelve million quid for someone that's got is going to leave for free in what four or mm -hmm. five months time. So I get it from that perspective, and we're building a new team. He's been great for us, so it, it, it is what it is. It's unfortunate it's gone to Arsenal, but who knows? Maybe he's going to do a little agent Jorginho for us and sabotage a title bid. We 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 we, we, we can hope. But... Not willing. <laughs> uh, moving forward to the game obviously we play Friday night against Fulham uh, it's only two weeks ago or just over that we went to Craven Cottage we were both there and we lost 2-1 Jao Felix got sent off on his debut um, it's, Fulham are doing well this season they're above us on the table they've got some good players Willian's coming back to the bridge scored in the fixture at Craven Cottage wouldn't bet against him scoring in this one either um, it's the sort of game that we need to be winning Players are back from injury. Chilwell's back. Reese James is back. Um, Sterling's back. Obviously, no Kovacic and no Zakaria still. Um, what are your thoughts heading into it? Uh, I mean, Mudrick will be there. I think our defence will be a bit more solid if we keep to the same back four. As Reese James, I think, still can't play a full 90. So, personally, don't start him. Just don't. I'd rather have Chalibur. If, I, if he has a bad performance, whatever. I don't care. Reese James' safety matters more to me. So... Um, yeah, defensively, I think we could be fine, but Fulham, they've been much better than us this season. They will not be pushovers at any point. And I don't know what midfield we're putting in because Kova is injured. Um, Loftus Cheek can't play a full 90. Um, Zakaria is injured as well. Zakaria is injured. So it's just and... Gallagher, Chakumeka, Hall, or Mount. And, and, and Enzo. Enzo. And oh Enzo. yeah, Enzo. Like we know, Enzo's going to be in there, isn't it? So yeah. Or God forbid, if he's out, like they forget. Just forget. Well, I think he's supposedly going to be in the squad. There was a few rumblings that mm. uh, there might have been a work permit issue. We didn't get international clearance or something. But I mean, I I, I think he, if he's in the squad, he definitely starts. I mean, if he doesn't start, if he's not available, then we have got a massive problem. But uh, let, let's I think presume we still have a problem in midfield because well, we're we still asking Enzo yeah. to just carry that midfield from minute one. Well, he'd have to play as a six if you go with a three-man midfield. I mean, you Probably. wouldn't want... I, mean, I don't think he can play a pivot because what, you're going to go with what with an Enzo Ruben pivot, an Enzo Gallagher pivot, an Enzo Mount pivot? No, it's not going to happen. So no. you'd have to go Enzo as a six and then I guess the eights. I'd like to see Chuck Romaker play. And I actually think Gallagher deserves to play ahead of Mason Mount. Based, based I just on... want Mount drop personally. Yeah, I think all these drop, performances... Yeah. Like, you're getting to a point now where he's not even being punished for them. He's not, he, he's just getting more complacent. Sorry, that Liverpool performance is still burnt in my head. Yeah. That, unless he has been literally messy in training, I, I can't even understand it. I mean, yeah, midfield, we've got 
issues. I think we obviously discussed Rhys James. It's always a fear that every time he comes back from injury, like something's going to happen to him again. Yeah. Um, we saw it against Bournemouth. I mean, look, Rhys James has got to start games with Chelsea at some point. And you think if you don't start him in this game, do you start him next week away at West Ham? I, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know how fit he is in terms of, has he got 90 in the tank? Has he got a half? Has he got 60? With five subs as well, I'd be more inclined to not start him and give him like half hour from the bench or something. Um, I think that would be a better way of doing things. I mean, on the left-hand side, we've seen, obviously, uh, Hall play left wing back ahead of Kukurea, uh for the last few games. Kukurea had a very good game at Anfield. Do you think Chilwell goes straight back? Does Chilwell go straight back into the team for you, or we've got to be, we've got to be careful with him as well? No, I think kukurella has been good enough the last few games yeah. that he deserves a start. I thought he was good against Palace. I thought Liverpool... Defensively, he did his job. You could ask yeah. questions about him progressively and being a bit too safe, fine. But like when you're playing against a player like Salah, personally, as long as you do your job defensively, I don't yeah. really care past that. So I don't see why he should be dropped. I don't think that back four should change. Like no. Reese James, take all the time you need. They've got two clean sheets in two. That's the first time we've had that since October. No reason whatsoever to change that, even for Reese James. Use that as just more time to just heal up and be ready. But as for right now, Chalaba to me stays at right back. Yeah, I think I, I agree that Kukurela left back. I mean, the beauty of having five subs and hopefully we can be in a decent position where we can actually be a few goals up or whatever and bring on the likes of James and Chilwell to give them 20, 25, maybe even half an hour just to, to, to get them back into the swing of things. I mean... We could see another debut tomorrow as well. I mean, what 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 chances do you think there are of Madueke being involved in some capacity? I mean, we don't, I don't think anyone knows an awful lot about him, but he's another sign that's come in for about twenty nine million pounds uh, in the January window. Uh, there's a lot of excitement around him. He looks promising. People that have watched more of him than I have seem to say good things about him. I mean, possible debut for him tomorrow night. I'm not saying from the start necessarily, but you'd imagine he 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 could feature from the bench. Yeah, I'd, I'd bring him off the bench personally. It's nothing about his ability. I just think Ziyech has been our best attacker the last yeah. two games. No reason to drop him. Sterling Especially going back in? everything that happened yesterday with PSG, yeah. I think you just drop his confidence even more if you instantly drop him after those two games. So personally, Ziyech goes straight back into the lineup. And and for you, Sterling obviously back fit again. Do you, he, he, he goes to the bench? So yes, bring Sterling back slow. I want to see Mudrick in a full 90. Yeah, Mudrick on, on the left. Yeah, Mudrick left. What would you go? Mudrick left, Ziek right, and then you will have Havertz as nine. I, I mean, suppose. I'd still want Oba personally, yeah. but we're gonna play Havertz, so yeah, play him. We'll see I mean, what he does with better service. Yeah, well, that's what I was gonna say. You know, obviously, you've always been an advocate with Bamiang saying that you know, look, it's not all his fault. If you give him service, then he he has proven that he can put the ball in the net for us. Um, he's not scored for a while, but it's admittedly not all his fault. Um, mm. do you actually think if We've had with with Mudrick on the left, and say obviously you've got Enzo's creativity that he possesses from midfield, whether it's a, a full fit Sterling or a Madueke on that right hand side. That it, we could actually Aubameyang could be half decent in the second half of the season because we should be getting better service to him. I mean, I'd say that, but I just I don't think Potter rates him really. I think no. all that either that or he's trying to focus on Havertz more because he could be more of a long term project for him, and that I understand. Like, I think Havertz is going to be our number nine until the rest of the season, unless we play a 4 3 3, and then I just bench him and I put Jao Felix in the middle. But yeah, it all it all just depends on him. Like, we're gonna have the question now, we're gonna have better players around him. So no more excuses. Like, if I see a good few games, fair enough. Like, I might start to invest to be fair. I might see what everyone's <laughs> talking about. If this guy is the same Havertz from the first half of the season, nobody talk to me. Nobody even yeah. talked to me. Just get like, rid of him. For me, I will let him. I will let him see what he's like with these new players. Yeah, because I I do hear what people are saying. I do think with better players around him, you could potentially see a better Havertz. But I'm asking the question: Is it because of the other players around him, or is it because of his impact as well? If he shows yeah. me that same impact as everybody else, fair enough. Fair enough. We might not even need to go for a nine. But yeah, I have to see it. All I've heard is excuses for too long. Yeah, no, I agree. He's got. He's clearly he's going to be the nine for the rest of the season. He's got to. For me, he's got to get this second half of the season. He needs about eight to ten goals in the league 
to to, mm -hmm. to prove to me that and actually he's probably going to be taking penalties as well. So I'm yeah. also saying like, do not be stat paying penalties. Yeah, <laughs> do it if you get the opportunities. Score yeah. if you get to 20 GNA with that. Fair play, but like I want to see some stuff from open play and also yeah. with your feet. If Havertz can figure out how to start finishing consistently with his feet, we have a number nine on our hands. Yeah, that to me would be the one thing that he needs to show me. One thing quick he wanted to ask before we round out with a score prediction. Forgot to mention it earlier. Champions League squad. We can obviously only register three of the new signings. Um, it's a bit of a headache for, for Graham Potter and, and stuff in, in, in that regard. Some some couple of big names are going to have to miss out. Um, Enzo definitely goes in, in there, as does Mudrick. Mm. I would have said Jao Felix for that third one because we signed him on loan and it would have been like the reason we would have got him is so he could have played in the Champions League. But part of me is also thinking that Low key, I'd actually like Badia Shield in there, but which ones you then leave out because Enzo and Mudrik can't get left out. So it's really it's Felix or Badia Shield, but I can't see Felix being left out either. It's a tough decision, isn't it? Uh, it it's more of a harsh decision to me, but for me, it's it's Enzo, Felix, Mudrik. Simple yeah. as like our attack is crap. I, yeah. I put all the mid and the midfield too, by the way. So, yeah, focus there. Badi Ashil has been very good. But we have Chalaba and Fafana will be back from injury soon. Yeah, that's true. So we, we don't need another centre-back necessarily. We need Felix because there's too many questions about the rest of our attack. We need Mudrik because literally nobody else is good at 1v1 dribbling consistently except him. And Enzo, because, like, I mean, look at our midfield options, like, before I even get into it. So, yeah, it has to be yeah. those three. It has yeah. to. Yeah, I think it will be them. I mean, the only, I said the only one you could perhaps make a case for is Badia Shield, but then it's quite yeah. hard to see who you leave out. But it, it's peak for him; it really is. Yeah. But I guess with I guess with Fafana being back, it kind of softens that blow a little bit for us. Um, yeah. You just have to, just have to hope that he can stay fit, which has been a problem for him. Um, hey, maybe Kulabali against a, a slower team might even be yeah. decent potential. Maybe score prediction for Fulham. Uh, Friday night. We'll both be there. Um, we, are we going to gather Willian Masterclass again on his return to Stamford Bridge? What are we thinking? Oh, God forbid. Um, <laughs> I'm going to be optimistic and say a 1-0 Havertz penalty. Yeah, fair, fair. I'm going to be optimistic. I mean, Mitrovic will be back for this game as well. He was missing from the first one, so we'll see if that makes a difference or oh. not. Um, I, remember, I remember we talked before the one at Craven Cottage. We didn't want to see the Vinicius doing the Mbappe. And that's exactly and what, what we, we got. Get? Yeah. <laughs> um, I, oh, I'm going to go, I'm going to go two. I'm going to go for a 2 1 Chelsea win. Um, I think we probably will concede. But I think, yeah, this is the start of a bit of a push on for the second half of the season. So I'll, I'll, I'll go 2 1 win. But to be honest, I'll take any win that is possible. Um, this is a good place to round out, guys. Make sure you smash the likes on the video if you haven't. Subscribe to Chelsea Fan TV. Leave your thoughts in the comments below. Make sure you check out our personal channel, Carefree Lewis G and the Blues Brothers, my channel. Subscribe to those, both linked in the description. And we'll catch you again in another episode soon, guys. Cheers. <laughs>